Okay, good afternoon everybody. Uh, welcome to the first of this, af this afternoon's sessions. Um, our first talk is going to be given by Professor Claire Davis of the University of Birmingham and it's examining uh, non-destructive, non-contact and microstructural characterization. So, over to you Claire. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon everyone. What I want to do um, this afternoon is start to talk about how we might move forward in terms of characterizing materials. And we've heard an awful lot about microstructures and how microstructures control properties and the importance of them. Well, wouldn't it be nice if we could get microstructural information without having to cut up the sample, without having to go through the process of sample preparation? And I think that there's quite a lot of advances that have been made that allowing us to get part way there. And I'd like to talk a little bit about where we've got to and actually where things might go in the future in terms of being allow, allowing us to get that kind of information. So what's the current state of the art? There are a number of systems. And I will say that today I'm only going to talk about electromagnetic systems. There's quite a lot of work that's been done on ultrasonic systems as well. But in today's talk, I'll just talk about electromagnetic systems. So in terms of um, commercial achievement, there are systems that can be bought and um, applied online during steel processing to extract information that comes directly from the microstructure, but a lot of that at the moment is done to infer mechanical properties so that uh, strip material, for example, can be released to the customers based on a... Um, mechanical property without doing mechanical property tests or to supplement mechanical property testing. And a lot of this work has been done for specific grades with empirical or semi-empirical correlations. And they work extremely well. However, as we start to change the steel type, change the processing, so the microstructures change subtly, those empirical relationships don't necessarily work. So we're part way there in terms of being able to get microstructural information and hence properties, but there's quite a, li quite a bit more that needs to be done. So the kinds of things that can, that can be done already are, and I've put some examples up here, but there's quite a lot in the literature where there's been relationships between a magnetic property or electromagnetic property and um, either mechanical property information, so here I show creep life, or indeed microstructural information that we might measure by, by other techniques such as metallography, such as recrystallized fraction. And so, again, there's quite a lot of information, there's quite a lot of lab-based tests that can do that, but in order to have something that is much more generically useful, so that somebody can use this, take it with, with um, different steel types without having lots of calibration samples, which is where we currently sit, we need to take this a little bit further. So in terms of thinking about the motivation and the challenges to move the, the field forward of non-structural evaluation, then we have several aspects. There's a need and a desire to be able to do online microstructural assessment because that's something we can't do metallography. You can't stop the mill halfway through and, and look at the hot microstructure dynamically. So there's quite a lot of uh, desire to not just infer microstructure through um, modeling and temperature information, but to get some kind of direct measure that's directly related to the microstructure. There's also desire for in situ inspection, where at the moment it may be either inferred from hardness measurements or possibly by looking at replicas, so you're getting a microstructural information, but it's surface dominated and you might want to look deeper into the material. And indeed, ultimately, wouldn't it be nice if we could measure all microstructures in complex materials uh, non-destructively? So I thought I'd talk a little bit about where things have, have got to and then some of the um, scientific basis of how this, this field is developing and where, where the challenges are to take it on even further. So we take phase transformation monitoring. So this is very much looking at um, in situ measurements during steel processing. Then very nice large signal changes. We talk about going from an osmotic phase to any of the uh, product phases, ferrite, perlite, bainite, martensite, whichever we want, provided we're below the Curie temperature, then we go from a paramagnetic phase to a ferromagnetic phase, and therefore get large signal changes. So here, if we plot, this is um, an output from electromagnetic sensor, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit about different measurement um, values in a, in a little while, but this is one that can be taken out. 
And as we cool down, get a little, little jump here, which is the Curie point, because um, even though this is an alloy steel, we get a little bit of ferrite forming before the bainitic transformation. And we pick up a, a very small volume fraction of ferrite. That, that signal change corresponds to about 3% 3, 3 uh, ferrite fraction formation. And then we get the uh, bainitic transformation here. So that's quite nice. You can prove in the lab. It's nice if you want to use it in a lab. That's fine. But really, the challenge is to take that beyond lab-based to um, production inspection. In order not to just rely on empirical correlations, there needs to be the fundamental um, either modeling work or the fundamental relationships that underpin the signals. So in order to do that, and again, this is a, a relatively nice, simple example, then there are two, two um, aspects that need to be considered. One is to consider the um, intrinsic uh, magnetic properties of the material, and the second one is to consider the properties of the particular sensor design and the target geometry of the component that you're inspecting. So in terms of looking at the intrinsic properties of the, the microstructure, then we can use um, varying modeling technologies. So this is a commercial package, but with imported microstructural information. So what's being represented here are um, the ferrite during formation. So you can see the ferrite forming around pyrosinite grain boundaries, for example, within a paramagnetic austenitic matrix. And the uh, net result, you can, you can extract out the magnetic properties of that material going through transformation. Here we have a representation of the sensor system, target material, and the sensor. And therefore, you can get the um, magnetic lines of flux generated for a particular sensor uh, target generation. Bring those two things together, and then you can get output what you expect the sensor to see for a particular microstructure for a given um, component and geometry. So that's quite nice that the, the fundamentals is there, uh, not just looking at correlations. In terms of where things have reached, well, we've reached the point where um, some of these sensors are now being used online. Again, these are for phase transformation. So I'm starting off with what, what actually is the easiest thing to look at, big signal changes. So here we have an example, um, and this has been done in collaboration with Tata Steel. And this particular application was for rod material. Um, so we have the um, material coming out onto the um, runout table here and sensors below rod. And, and I think this is quite a nice example of where actually complex target material can be examined. Rod is not ideal for trying to do non-destructive evaluation of. That it's a difficult geometry. If you look at the way that the, the rod lays in WAPs as it comes along this runout table, then you're not necessarily sure how much target material you've got ahead of your, your um, sensor head. So it's a difficult, very difficult um, manufacturing challenge to, to overcome. Again, coming back to this idea that there's different magnetic signals and different um, sensor signals that you can, you can take out. There's some analytical work that was done by our collaborators at, at Manchester found that if we take a, a particular aspect, which is the phase angle, you can become lift off and target um, geometry relatively insensitive. So provided you've got some of your hot steel there, that you're not then going to um, worry about your signal changing because you're different amounts of the steel there. You're just looking at the transformation characteristics. And this is where some of this nice fundamental work and the modeling fits alongside. So just to show, again, show where this kind of technology reaches. Oh, this is the output. This is probably the most Im important graph here. What we've got is a, an output signal, in this particular case, phase angle, with time. And I'm showing the signal for two coils as they come through. What you can see here, or hopefully you can see, initially we get a signal with a very large phase angle. This drops down, and then we get a, not quite constant, but a low phase angle for the remaining part of the coil. What this translates as is the first bit of the coil as it comes out and goes on to the, the runout table um, comes out before the water sprays are switched on. So this is untransformed. Then the water sprays are switched on, and this particular position of where the sensor is located, that rod is then fully transformed. So we can clearly see untransformed or austenitic material here, and the remaining being 
um, ferromagnetic, so it's transformed into the, the perlitic state, which is what was, um, was desired. Why is this kind of thing useful? Well, one, this would be useful from a production point of view that you know exactly how much material at the front of your coil that hasn't reached the microstructure under the conditions that you want. So what would need to be cut off, where to inspect, so that you can measure properties for release specifications. But more than that, you can um, start to use arrays and map microstructures. So we talk about uniformity. Sometimes we want uniformity or homogeneity, and as we've heard, some cases we don't want it. But what we do want to know is to be able to measure what we have when we've got our material. Whether we want uniformity or not, we want to be able to measure it. And here's an example using an array of sensors. And this was um, for rolled plate material in a um, pilot plant mill at, at Tata Steel coming out hot and then just going over a bed of an array of sensors. And we can map the transformation. So here it's been um, just on a color scale. And we can map the transformation, one, as it's happening in, um, over time, but also looking at it spatially in terms of how cooling might affect this. The, the other thing I haven't mentioned but is quite useful is that electromagnetic te techniques are not sensitive to water spray. They're not sensitive to dust. So we can put it in quite aggressive environments, which is a, a nice advantage. So a brief summary of where things are and then perhaps where we might want to be going. At the moment, the online systems for phase transformation are, um, are, are, are taking off. So there's systems, as you've seen, in rod mills. There's a couple of systems now in um, or trial systems in strip mills. In fact, one was switched on and started running just over a month ago. So we're starting to get data now in terms of strip steels and, and different types of steel microstructures. We can model what we'd expect for a given microstructure. We can take into account different target geometries. However, that's, that's for relatively simple microstructural changes where we're talking about phase transformation. Now, we can take into to account spatial variation. So if you have a banded microstructure, so we all know the ferrite perlite banded microstructures or some of the ones where, where we'd have um, compositional segregation. We can take into account banded, banded materials. So that's, that's quite nice. But really what we need is something that can deal with even more complex microstructures where we've got more than one variable changing. In order to be able to extract information that is much more detailed about, about the microstructure, we have to go back to what we mean by, or what type of magnetic behavior we have, and therefore what aspect of microstructure is sensitive to different uh, magnetic behaviors. So can we extract more data from the system? So this is showing a BH curve um, for the material. And I want to illustrate a couple of key, key factors within this so we can link now what's going on from the magnetic behavior to the microstructural behavior. So a lot of what we've done so far is dealing with the initial magnetization. So we have a material that's obviously hot. It has no prior magnetic history. So we're starting with, with a material that's paramagnetic, no prior magnetic um, history, and applying very small fields. So what I've been talking about so far has been very much in, in this area. And we look at the initial permeability, which is the slope of this initial part of the curve. Obviously, as you start to apply a field, you start to, to change the magnetic behavior, the domain structure, and we get different aspects. So we go up to saturation. Um, here we have um, the remnants um, at this point here, and you'll find in the literature quite a lot of people measure remnants values and, and relate those to microstructure values. At any point, if you look at the um, high detail, you see that these are not smooth curves but have a lot of steps to them. That's how we get magnetic Barkhausen noise information. Um, the difficulty is, is, is trying to relate this to microstructural information. We have the cohesivity, and later on I'm going to talk about um, the permeability as you go and sweep around the BH curve. So have in mind the fact that we've got these different types of values. But actually what's more important is how does this relate to the microstructure and the magnetic character, because we want microstructural information at the end of the day. So if we start at um, the bottom part and come through up into our BH curve, then what we, what we need to um, try and visualize is the idea of having magnetic domains in the material. 
And to go through a BH curve, then you're going to have to move magnetic domain walls. Magnetic domain walls, as they move, will interact with microstructural features that act as pinning points. And so we start to get this idea of the magnetic behavior being linked into microstructure because the microstructural features pin magnetic domain walls, and we're going to be worrying about domain wall movement. What we've been looking at so far is this initial part down here where the domain walls haven't actually been moving a great distance. They've just been wobbling. They've not been moving. They've just been wobbling backwards and forwards, but they've still got influence of pinning. But as you start to apply higher fields, you can then start to overcome pinning points. And then the concept here that becomes important is how strong are the pinning points and how many of those pinning points do we overcome as we apply different levels of field? And if we can reverse engineer that, we can say, well, for this field, we're re overcoming these microstructural features. Therefore, we can get information about those specific features. OK, in order to, to do that, not just in theory, we need to be able to observe the interaction between microstructure and um, the magnetic properties. So here's an example, and I'll show a few more of these, of what we mean by domains within steels. A lot of you may be familiar with this within magnets or indeed electrical steels. When we talk about engineering steels, they are quite a bit more complex, and the domain structures are generally finer. So looking at these domain structures, then we have um, packets with parallel domain walls. So we're going to be looking at these domain walls and how they, how they move. And you can see these packets of domains. To link through to microstructure, then we need to start to say, well, how do or how does different aspects of the microstructure affect the, the domain structure uh, and hence the um, sensor signals? So here I've got two images that hopefully sitting there you look at and go, well, they look exactly the same. They are pretty much the same. The only difference is the size scale. And that's because this material has a, a, a grain size. It's a low carbon steel, so we're talking about ferrite grain size, that's much smaller. But hopefully what you can see are clear domain packets. And what we've done is link domain packets to um, microstructure in this size, grain size. So just overlaying a grain structure image with a, a magnetic domain image. And for the previous images that I showed you, you find one, one magnetic domain packet per ferrite grain. Interestingly, as you start to increase the grain size, you start to see multiple packets per ferrite grain. So this lovely large ferrite grain in the middle, you can see, hopefully, you can see that there are different packets, uh, domain packets with different orientations. This grain has one domain packet orientation in it, but a very large grain such as this, we've got different domain packets. And in terms of linking microstructure to, to features, then if you take those, the conditions where you've just got one domain per grain size, then you can get very nice correlations between the um, magnetic property of the material here, relative permeability for low field, we're just wobbling these domain walls, and grain size it follows a whole patch type relationship. So you can start to build up relationships between individual magnetic features and um, the magnetic behavior and therefore the electromagnetic signal. That's nice, but it's not really developing us uh, and allowing us to look at very complex microstructures, which is where we want to get to eventually. So the next stage is to say, OK, if we want to move to complex microstructures, then we need to take domain walls past weak pinning points onto major pinning points and start to sweep through that BH curve, but separating out the microstructural features of interest. In order to do that, we want to, well, one, be able to measure pinning strengths, but two, be able to observe this. So you've got direct correlations between what measurements you have and the, 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 what's happening physically within the material. So some of the um, researchers in the group have developed a system for dynamic observation of domain wall mo uh, motion. So we have uh, s um, samples within coils and then um, just putting on a high-speed camera to observe this as it goes through. Now, here's two images. This is a, um, the same, it's exactly the same material. Overlaid in red is the grain structure. And within that, what we've got is, let's take this grain as a good example. Hopefully, you can see the parallel domain walls. So this is the static domain pa pattern 
without any applied field. If you apply a field, then what you can see is these domain walls have now moved and we've changed the internal domain structure. So we've got um, some of these um, walls moving, the um, closure domains changing as well. Here's an example. We've got complex domain structure, but you can see, again, how domain walls have mo moved. And what we can do is watch this in using videos and actually see, as you apply the field, the domain walls moving backwards and forwards and overcoming pinning points. As you increase the field, you can watch how far those domain um, walls move. In order to do this, uh, and to take this further, we then need to relate the domain structure and the um, output magnetic properties to specific microstructural features. So here, taking the mean free path for domain wall motion. So for example, taking measurements of lath size or interparticle spacing size or grain size and relate that to the fundamental material property. And very quickly, I'd like to just show a case study of how this can be applied. So if we take complex steels, so we take complex steels such as P91 power generation steels, then what I want to show is um, some differences that can be obtained by looking at complex microstructures. So in this particular case, we've got two P91 steels. The only difference between them is the aluminium nitrogen ratio, which affects the um, amount of MX precipitates within the material. So this is, this is work that's been done uh, on these materials um, that we've been given. But what we've then done is relate this to the electromagnetic signals. And very importantly, if we're looking now at relating what we know to what's going on, and therefore to properties, if we look at, for example, the last milliparameter, which are temperature time parameters, we can see that the initial behavior of the material, there is no sensitivity for electromagnetic signal, even though we know microstructural features are changing. And that's because we've got competing features. So we're losing, for example, dislocation density, which acts as a, a pinning point, uh, but we're gaining um, precipitation, so that the two offset each other, but we then would see the increase in the signal. If we move to the other material, we see exactly the same be behavior, but this increase here, we start to get coarsening, is um, deferred to a later time. And that's because this material has uh, many more pinning precipitates, and therefore its creep behavior is better. Its aging behavior and creep behavior is better. But we can also see the, a clear differentiation between the materials because of the different features. More MX precipitates, um, and therefore a um, different signal. So we can differentiate between materials. Really where I want to finish with this is to say that we're starting to get to the point where you can clearly define microstructural features and how they impact. The next stage is to sweep through and do little, little wobbles of domain walls as you go through so you can start to see how the different microstructural features will affect things. So I'll summarize here, but I'll leave it with a question really for the audience is that the idea is where will we be going in the future? It's not just where we are now. And I think that in the future, there'll be an awful lot, both electromagnetic but also ultrasonic type signals, where we no longer need to always measure microstructure. We'll be able to get an awful lot of information out from these non-destructive uh, methods. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, are there any questions from your audience? So, yeah. Hi. Um, thanks, that was really interesting. I have a, a couple of questions. Firstly, um, are there any kind of resolution limits to either of these two techniques in terms of how refined of a microstructure you could theoretically or you can at the moment actually um, look at? Yes, there, there are going to be some. For the first thing is you need to have features that interact with the domain walls. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the nature of the domain wall and what the microstructural feature is as to how strong that interaction is and, and whether there's a significant interaction at all. So, so there are going to be some aspects that, that you can't do. I think the biggest challenge to this is where you've got competing factors, which is why I put the P91 up. It's, it's not the answer to everything, and that's why it needs the, the fundamental understanding, not just purely um, empirical correlations, to be able to say what can you measure and under what circumstances. Yeah. Okay. And the other question was with the uh, magnetic um, testing at the moment, I see that you're using just a, pr a prepared sample and putting that in the, in the coil. Um, so is, it, is that something that you could um, theoretically 
transfer on to a production line? Oh, where you yeah, absolutely. We, we've done that in terms of phase transformation. The reason we use little prepared samples is because we want to observe the microstructure as we apply the field. But then you just design the sensor for the particular target application. Okay. So, for example, our, um, the team we work with at Manchester are designing now for tube inspections for power plants. So, yes, this is not limited to, to lab. And that, that's really the key point, is it's not just lab-based uh, measurements. This, this can be transferred to a number of different uh, environments. Okay. Yeah. And, and just quickly, um, what's the influence of the fact that you've got like a three-dimensional microstructure that you're trying to translate into in, in what we see as two-dimensional images? Is it just the surface that you're looking at, or do no, you have influence? No, you have to take into account... Well, it depends, again, what it is that you're looking at and whether you can assume that you've got something that is uh, uniform and homogenous. But no, you can take into account the three-dimensional nature. So some of the models we can run, we can run three-dimensional models. It's just more computing power. So you run that when you have to. Um, you deal with 2D if you can assume symmetry. Okay, so yeah. you could theoretically like look at a slice, do you think, through... like. You, you can. There are some other limitations in terms of the fact that you're using electromagnetic fields and therefore you have the skin depth effect. So depending on how you design your sensor and what the material is as to how deep you can go through. So you use multi-frequency sensing. So the high frequencies, you're, you're very surface dominated, but you can use lower frequencies or, or play some other tricks so you can penetrate deeper into the material. Oh, that's really so, okay. Thank you. If yeah. we go to Sorry. another question. Okay, um, it's a similar question to the previous one, actually. Uh, what kind of spatial resolution can you get, for example, if you have a, a very heterogeneous uh, specimen with, uh, I was thinking of these power plant components where you might have some particular part which has experienced more stresses and is in a higher degree of microstructural degeneration. How closely can the techniques you have at the moment pinpoint that? It's, there's no single answer to that. It, it depends really what you're designing to do. So if you particularly wanted to look at very fine scale, then you design sensors that had, um, for example, the, the magnetic poles that are very close together, so you can, you can then map on a local level. Um, the difficulty with that is then you're going to be much more surface, surface dominated because you can't get your signal in very far. If you're looking at something where you want to, you want to average because you're looking at a, a bulk property, then you can get your signal in more and you design a different types of sensor. So some of this can be done by sensor design which is part of the reason why this work has to be collaborative. So you have to work with electronic engineers, electrical engineers, for example, which is what we do. Um, so there's no single answer to your question. What do you mean by close together? Do you, do you mean a couple of millimetres, a couple of microns? Uh, um, at the moment, we, we haven't gone down to looking at, at things on the, the sub-millimetre level. Mm -hmm. It's not something that um, has driven the work that, that we're doing. There is, um, there is work where people are looking at at miniature sensors, um, and so therefore there is potential for doing that. But until we've understood the relationship between the signal and the microstructure to make sure that fundamentally you can measure the things of interest that might be happening on that sub-millimeter scale, it, you know, it's when do you push the development on the sensor, when do you push it on the, on the um, relationships. So at the moment there's quite a lot still on relationships and designing sensors that can exist in robust I environments. I was yeah. just thinking in terms of this, this creep curves, I mean actually what usually happens in creep tested specimens is that the, the deformation can be actually quite local, the failure can be quite local. So if you're measuring something which is actually over the whole specimen, yeah. you're getting some... We're not looking at creep, at creep failure. This is still very early stage yeah. in terms of microstructural changes. So you've not got any creep damage developing in, this, in the materials that we're looking at. Um, but yes, you're right. If you go to, to where you're getting local, local deformation mechanisms, then yes. And then you would de design something to look at that, um, if that becomes the, the priority to look at, for example. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, there might be situations where interaction of the domain wall with the phoenix site might depend on the direction at which the domain wall approaches that. Phoenix. Yes. Yeah. So I, yeah, I agree with you. So Crystallography becomes very so important. How do, you, how do you sort of disentangle that sort of you know, information? Yeah. Um, I mean, yes, it's something that I didn't go into in the talk. We have done work where, for example, we've done EBSD to look at the crystal orientation or grain orientation and look at how the domains interact with um, or how the domain walls move within different grains of different orientation. Um, and that, that would then allow different orientational effects. 
Likewise, with inhomogeneous microstructures, where, for example, you might have a banded microstructure, depending on how your field is applied, whether you're applying it parallel or perpendicular to the, the microstructural banding, you'll get different results. Those are things that we are starting to be able to take and into for account. Example, we know in, in some metallic glass systems, you know, yeah. you, you have this elliptical FE3B type inclusions, or uh, uh, pressing case, very fast. Yes, yeah. So if the wire approaches along the longitudinal axis, it yeah. goes through. It's yeah. like a soft thinning side. But if it comes mm -hmm. along the minor axis, it spins down. Yeah. So the coercivity depends on which in Yeah, uh, absolutely. Side. There's lots of so different it might features in that. Other no, you're quite right. And the, the thing with this kind of work is that those factors can be taken into account. It's you, you pick off, you pick off the, the features of most interest. So we started off with bulk phase transformation because that was, well, at the time it was hard, but now looking back, that was the most easy thing to do. So you start to go down the list of things that you're, you're interested in. So looking at that, at that type of aspect, it's on the list to do, but it's, it's something that, and that's why I leave this with how far can we go, because um, that's not reached yet, but that is something that can be done. Okay, we're gonna, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. If that's okay. I'm, I'm sorry that we can't answer all the questions.